Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. I study meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity because many of them are very useful and their possible explanations provide us with clues to how reality works. Meaningful coincidences occur in all aspects of human life. Uh, but you got to like look around for them. I mean, you got to believe that they're there and they might be useful before you kind of like see them because yes, yeah, seeing is believing, but in this business, believing is a seeing a lot more. I mean, you got to believe it to be able to even pick it up. So tell each other coincidence stories, listen to this podcast and read my psychology today blog. And there's lots of other stuff out there, but they happen a lot and they can be useful. You can order my new book, Meaningful Coincidences, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendipity Happen. The button's down there. And the book's out September 16th. So, so, September 6th. So that's pretty close. So if you pre-order, it's almost like ordering it right now. So my story today, which I've told our guest Maureen about, Maureen St. James. St. James. Saint Germain. I mean, I like the I like Saint Saint James Infirmary, which is why I wrote that down there. <laughs> and I'm still fascinated with the Saint Germain name and and how you how that works with you. But uh, we'll we'll maybe get to that. But the, this story is about mirroring each other, two people mirroring each other, and uh, it's a story from uh, psychotherapist Yvonne Tarnas, who told me and has written other people this mirroring story. She's a therapist and years ago in her early training as a therapist, I sat listening to a patient's recalling a terrible fight between her teenage self and her father on a family camping trip. Her shame and sadness, her shame and sadness were palpable. What startled me through out the whole story was that the story in nearly every detail captured an identical experience I had had as a teenager with my father, also on a family camping trip. Aside from being shocked to hearing my own story, I had to re-experience my own carefully tucked away pain and shame. So our guest today, Maureen St. Germain, is an internationally acclaimed Ascension teacher. Maureen has been granted, and we're going to talk about what this granting thing is because, okay, yeah, you get grants from the U.S. government, but you got grant, you got a grant from someplace, um, granted access to a dimension that has been closed to most of humanity for eons. I think there's little bits of connections other people are having, but you got the big download of it. You got the big connection. And it's fascinating to me what you're experiencing and what you can, what you know, what you feel. It's a direct channel to source. Her latest book, Mastering Yourself, Mastering Your 5D Self, follows on the heels of her award-winning best-selling book, Waking Up in 5D and Beyond the Flower of Life. Maureen has taught in person in 24 countries, as well as the American Center for, Centers, Kripalu and Omega Institute. Her books have been translated in 12 languages. She's been around. It's just, this lady has been around talking about 5D. And I'm so glad we're able to do this again. We, we met once before on the radio, but we were really looking at each other this time. So, Maureen, it's great to see you. It's nice connecting with you again. And so let's go for it. You know, I really appreciate that fabulous intro. And I want to comment. When <clears throat> at a certain point after I had been given this information that I had been given direct access, 
I'm thinking, well, am I the only one who got this connection? And I was like, no, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. You know, okay, there goes your ego, right? But then I was told, but you would help many. You would teach many how to go there. And I believe now that, that would, they were talking about the access to the Akashic Records. Well, before, before we get to 5D and Akashic Record, which are still unclear to me, I mean, I, I have my ideas. I love your question. <laughs> you, <laughs> ask, you ask. <laughs> am I the only one? Yeah. Or you could have said, why me too? But it's also, <laughs> am I the only one? And that's so important about coincidences because a lot of people have weird stuff happen to them. And they think, oh, I'm so special because it's happened to me. But you were smart enough, aware enough, clear enough to recognize you probably aren't the only one and you weren't. And the same is true of all kinds of things that people do. The simplest idea is, is people um, making big discoveries and thinking they're the only ones who did it. But if I've thought of it, other people are thinking about it, are going to think about it or have thought about it. And you're aware of that. Yeah, you know, even in science, there were like five people who filed a patent for the telephone at the same time. Alexander Graham Bell got there first. That's all. Yeah. Elisha Gray, uh, Alexander yeah. Bell, uh, 1876, uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Yep. Big argument. Did this. that one. Wow. One of my oh. faves. One of my faves because it was Valentine's Day and it's communication. You got, yeah. you got, the, but yeah. that you got that. I mean, that you know that one. That's really cool because that's what we're talking about. So, and you, and you picked the telephone because you got a tele, <laughs> you got a telephone to someplace called the source. And, hello, <laughs> source speaking. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> oh, my own Maureen. Did I call the wrong number? <laughs> Not only that, but think about the coincidence of you telling the original story about the psychotherapist that you knew. And then, you know, you're not the only one kind of a thing, which really was kind of funny. I was laughing at myself when they told me no, uh, no. And I'm thinking, oh, I thought I was special. You know, it's kind of a, a joke on myself. Yeah. But then for me to pick the one thing that you would resonate with on the um, Alexander Graham Bell. So that's very, to me, that's a nice yummy coincidence right here in live uh uh podcast yeah that's what that. I, I love those and they're maybe happening more and then i could add that they called your number <laughs> good job <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea it's all poetry you know it's all it it's, it's all really analogs cool. It's really, I would prefer to think of life as a musical and we, we got to put this to, to kind of a tune so we could sing it. So this, it's part of the fun of uh, learning about all about this stuff. I agree, fabulous. Well, the other thing you did, Maureen, which I recommend our listeners do, if they hear a voice or got a connection to something, to say, what? <laughs> you talking to me or something like that? I heard a voice a couple of weeks ago that said go left or go right, where I wasn't sure whether to go left or right. And uh, it, it, it was, there's a lot, of, a lot of extra to it, but uh, the voice said go left. And it started, it was going to thunderstorm. So I said, uh, I said, why go, why go left? I, I challenged the voice. And the voice said, you'll see. And two things that I've been imagining that I would like to have happen, happened because I went left. But challenging the voice, having a dialogue with the voice is more what we're talking about. And I mean, I'm so glad you came up with the telephone because we're doing that again. We're talking about having a dialogue with the voice. And, and you know, the number one question to ask is, who are you? Who are you? And are you of 100% light? Because there are plenty of uh, compromised energies or, or resources, we will say, that will influence you. And you could be channeling 
garbage or or stuff that would be hurtful and not even know it because you think you're listening to an outside energy, the voice. How, Maureen, does one make the distinction? You ask. They're not a lot. The, the energies that come in your head that give you that voice or that sensation or the words may not say they are of the light. So if you say, I'll tell you a story about a woman uh, who was sitting on a park bench and she had a vision and she felt this energy come in and, and this very handsome guy, like really yummy, attractive man sits down next to her. This is all in her vision. She's sitting in a park. And the, the man says, uh, I have the secret, secrets to eternal youth. Are you interested? And her first question was, are you 100% God-like? No, but I've got these great secrets for uh, um, staying young. Don't you want them? And she said, get lost. You're not of the light. I don't deal with you guys. Get out of here. And they have to leave. So it's really important to establish that whatever you're getting in terms of an intuition or a voice like you described, you say, are you 100% God-like? Who are you? Because they have to identify themselves when you ask. You you and I have eminent domain in this reality. That means what we say goes. So if we ask, they have to answer, not an option. Now, that's a that's an important rule right there, Maureen. Mm -hmm. That's an important rule to know. Uh, they got to they got to be truthful. And what's the question again? You're something about light, but I didn't understand. Are you of 100 percent God light? Are you of one? Light? Are you of 100% source God light? Exactly. Exactly. Because what's interesting is a person can be channeling what might be good information, and then they'll sneak in something that wasn't so right, some wackiness. And I compare it to the lost leader in the grocery store. They sell your favorite potato chips for under cost to get you in, and then you do all this other shopping. Oh, they have this. Oh, well, they have this. And you don't bother price checking that stuff because you got your potato chips for half price. And it's a little bit like that. You know, it's like a come on. You get a bunch of good information. So you think that this is a reliable channel, that this is an OK channel. And it will give you enough good information that you'll buy the whole package. Well, you know something? Coincidences have been used like that for a long time. where the salesperson tries to find a coincidence between the salesperson and the potential buyer. Oh, you're from Peoria? Oh, that's cool. Um, I used to live in so-and-so place and I used to shop here and I know so-and-so. Did you go, what school did you go to? And these, they begin to find overlaps geographically or if they can, other ways. And then that's like buying the low cost potato chips, then you start listening to the rest of their story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think finding common ground is useful. Um, but it's very tempting, especially if you're a young person wanting to get more access to the other world, the unseen side of life, that you would be eager to get that kind of information um, but it's always going to be compromised. It's always be compromised. Mm -hmm. be you get it. two pieces of good stuff and one piece of garbage, and the goal is to get you to buy into that little bit of garbage, and then you're hooked into that, you know, downward spiral. I'm sorry to say, but I've I've never tried cocaine, but I think that's how they get you started on cocaine. They oh, just try a little bit, and then you know you get hooked in. It's true of a lot of things. Uh, heroin uh, also. Um, it's that that first heroin experience is where the word heroin is related to. It becomes the heroin of your life, saving you. Oh, I did not know that. It, they sound the same. I, I like uh, homonyms and playing with how they might be related. Right. And I do, too. Yeah. You do, too? <laughs> yeah. And I also like, um, I find alliteration very powerful. And so when I'm in the Akashic Records and, and for myself and a bunch of alliteration comes through, I pay attention because I know that they're working to get me to pay attention. Ah, 
Alliterations are fun. <laughs> and they are get artful and awesome. <laughs> I could go on. But yeah, that whole business. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 the love of the language, I think. We're very fortunate that we have so many words to choose from. Not every language has as many words as we do. That's uh the love of language. Well uh, the why don't we do with a, a one of your coincidence stories and see if we can then wander from that to uh, the 5D, what is that? What's 4D versus 3D? I know you've talked about this with plenty of people, but I'd like our audience to hear it and I'd like to hear it again myself. And then how all that might be related to uh, meaningful coincidences is where I'm kind of interested, but I'll... I am interested. So, but, and I'll try to get us in that direction because I can tell you and I are going to wander off in all kinds of places because it's too much fun <laughs> not to do that. Uh, it, it's too much fun to wander. I mean, so tell us a story, Maureen. Tell us a story. Um, a recent story in my life of a big coincidence was a property that I was trying to buy in Arizona to host my school. And this was a nice sized property. They had like 10 bedrooms and a swimming pool and a little chapel. And it was owned by a couple. Um, the wife and had been- bedrooms? A... Well, they did converted a bunch of outbuildings to bedrooms, yeah. So it's- was... still a good sized baby, yeah. Yeah, and um, but it felt right. And the owner's wife had passed away and she was a mystic and she had a small following. And some of those people live there, you know, on the property. So I thought this is perfect for me. And I had been given a small sum of money to uh, start the school and had been told you need to be in Sedona by the person who gave me the money. Um, so I'm thinking this is a perfect match. And I do all my manifestation work. I ask my staff to work on it. I asked my Ascension Institute people, the people who studied with me for a year. And I really had on the board, on the vision board, this or something better. Okay. After nine months, no more money comes in. I don't get any sizable grants. I cannot afford this property. It's not, it's out of my range. And so the owner in finally decides to let somebody else have a go at it. So it goes under contract. And while well, I'm leading a group in Egypt. And so I had a chance to really do my own work on that, let it go came back, decided to look at another property. And as soon as I started looking, everything shifted. Within one day of announcing to my realtor I was interested in this particular property. She said, oh, that went under contract just a few hours ago. So then later that day, she says, um, I don't know what it cost me to do this, but I went out to look at this property um, and it was almost like somebody else was driving the car. Um, but I think this is a property for you. And if you if you really want there was, to- There was as if someone else was driving the car. As if, yeah. Because she didn't really have an agenda to go see this house. But she, you know, you sometimes you just driving- I, I, I paused you on that one just because sometimes blah, blah, blah. Yes, that happens. And another one of our little uh, coincidences for today with you and me, is that I interviewed someone named Nicole Froelich uh, in Denver uh, the other day, and, and she's into what she calls internal GPS, that you get to where you need to go without really having the directions to get there, but something gets you there. Intuition, maybe a little voice, turn left, turn light, as, as that voice with me, but something that isn't what you would call your regular way of thinking gets you to do that. So I call it uh, human GPS and have lots of stories in my book about that. And so I just want to uh, sidelight that this is a human capacity. I met a guy yesterday on Zoom who's an EMT, an emergency medical technician who you know rides around in ambulances. Yeah, he rides around in ambulances, but he also psychically can find his way to people who need him mm. without knowing who they are or where they are. 
and he gets to, he gets to them. So it's it's an expansive property that you just uh, indirectly describe. So comment on that if you wish, and let's hear more. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty right on. It happens to me a lot as well. So uh, she calls me from the house and says, I, I want to take you on a virtual tour. And we get all done. And she says, now, Maureen, if you want this house. And before she can say anything else, the voice in my head said, no matter what she tells you, do exactly what she says. So the house was underpriced to create a bidding did you ask the voice? Uh, I recognized it as my higher that, self. That's, that, that, that's, what, that's very important. You've right. learned to be able to recognize right. it as your higher self. Ladies right. and but gentlemen. If you're, if you're a newbie, you got to check. That's all there is to it. You um, have learned. I mean, I, I, I can't underline that more. You have to learn how to know it's your higher self. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I really specialize in is teaching people how to get 100% accuracy from their higher self in six weeks. And it is absolutely astounding what a person can do in that time frame. And um, after I finish the story, if you want me to share how that's done, I can. Or we could just give people a link and they can download some teaching materials and work with the information. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I spent a lot of years perfecting it. So it's cool. Very cool. So, so the voice tells me no matter what she says, you have to do it. So she says, you know, this price is, the house is underpriced. And I said, yeah. And she said, if you want this property, you're going to have to bid $100,000 more than the asking price. And you have to place your order. You have to um, write the contract tonight because I know they're going to make a decision and be done. Can you imagine being told that? Yes. I said, okay, let's do it. And later when I was sharing with her what happened, she said, um, Maureen, who listens to their realtor? And we both laughed because nobody does. Later we found out two things. Number one, the next highest bidder below me offered 95,000 over list. And I think that that realtor probably said the same thing that my realtor said. And the buyer thought, well, I'll shave a little off of it. I don't have to add, I don't have to do what they say because people want to be in their egos. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. When we went through title search, and by the way, I did get the house. Um, we went through title search. We discovered that the owner, one of the owners of this property that I got was the same couple whose property I was trying to buy from. And I had been praying to the deceased mystic, asking her to help me get the, pro the property. Isn't that wild? And you got the property. I did. It just wasn't the one you thought it was. Right, and it was one third the price. So it was in my price range. I believe... Ms. St. James, Ms. St. Maureen, Maureen, I love, I'm sorry, Miss <laughs> Maureen, <laughs> St. Germain. I, it, oh, oh, I know why I have trouble with Germain. It's it, the English word Germain is, means like uh, appropriate to the circumstance. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's, so that's where I'm mixing it up. It, it has a really profound Eng, regular English meaning to it. It's mm -hmm. germane to the subject. Right. Oh, man. Right. I, didn't, I didn't get that. Now, now I don't have to f flit around with it. So you are in, in the, under the impression now <laughs> that the, the mystic that you were trying to connect with got you to where you needed to be rather than where you thought you wanted to be. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is so much fun. That is, that is so much fun. And it's what musicals are made out of, that sort of thing. But <laughs> at a higher level, anyway, I hope they'll do it sometime. It's a, it's a dance thing. It's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful story. You got what you wanted without knowing that's what you wanted. Uh, and that's what you got. And what, that's what you want. Okay, that's really cool. That's really cool. So 
I'd like to know about what you mean by, but before 5D, how did it happen that Marine St. Germain got to be given this connection to source that you have? How did that happen? Um, I was uh, teaching in Atlanta and my host was taking me to dinner and she said, I need to stop by my building project. Um, and I said, well, can I wait in the car and I'll take a nap? And she said, sure. So when I was coming out of the nap, I got a very clear message that Madeline Dumont, an astrologer in uh, Atlanta that I knew, I had a message for me. So I called and left a message for her. And when she called back, I said, so are you going to update my chart? And she said, no. First of all, you have to know, I don't do messages for people. It's not my thing. I get messages for me, but I don't do messages for anybody else. So when I checked in with my guidance on what I was supposed to do, I said the same thing. Should I be updating Maureen's chart? And they said, no, we have a message for her. And the message was the message that you already announced, that I was being given access to a, a dimension that had been close to humanity for eons. And there were some more personal messages. I was being given a permanent guide and a bunch of other things. Um, you were given a permanent guide. Mm -hmm. That's no small little thing right there. <laughs> hey, hey, I got, <laughs> I, I got one assigned to me. Or I, I got myself a permanent guide. I mean, <laughs> that's like... All right, I got myself a permanent guide. And somehow <laughs> the permanent guide was assigned by somebody that you could trust. I mean, that was what's important here. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so um, I think it was either work that I came in to do or that I had agreed to take it on earlier in my work with the Akashic Records, I was in a group that turned out they were out of integrity. So I- it Turned out what? They were out of integrity. They were yeah. out of integrity. Yeah. They ran they out of their- stuff They weren't supposed to. They ran out of their integrity bunch. <laughs> yeah, really. The money ran so out. The integrity I, ran out. I, I was, you know, screaming, why did you guys tell me to work with these people? Blah, blah, blah. And- they said, we wanted you to know. We wanted you to know so you would start your own group. And I thought that, you know, so you do what you're told. That's another story. I, you'll like this one. I, when people say, uh, how do you know where to go next or what to do? My answer is, I always go where I'm towed. Where I'm towed. <laughs> it's like a five-year-old. I go where I with the with the nose being clawed. I go where I go where I'm towed. <laughs> right. And so you hear in English, told or towed. Isn't that great? Yeah. So um I don't know what I did in real time to be given this gift. But I have a feeling that I had signed up for it and would would make magic with it. So I have. I'm very grateful to have that privilege. Yeah, you signed up for it, maybe. You don't know really, but you got it. Uh, you were, I think most important is you were prepared to be, to be able to do it. I think mm -hmm. that's so critical in it. Mm -hmm. You were somehow prepared. You've been studying the Akashic record, um, which mm -hmm. somehow also connected. But what? Tell us what the Akashic record is to you. Well, the word Akashic is sky or anything that's not of the world. It's a Sanskrit term, and the the phrase Akashic records was popularized by some early mystics of the early 1900s. Madame Blavatsky, I think. Yeah, Blavatsky. And um, Edgar Casey talked about the Akashic Records when he was asked, where are you getting this information from? And he would say, from the person, uh, their field, and from the Akashic Records. And then he was asked, well, what are the Akashic Records? And he said, it is the same as the Book of Life, as described in the Old Testament. So for me, 
the Akashic Records is a vast system of a database that carries all the information and all the things we have done, all the things we are presently doing, and then potentiality and probability. And there's those two words are, you know, that alliteration thing, but they have separate meanings. Um, potentiality is, is um, the things I've thought about. Like if I'm a high school student and I'm thinking about three different colleges and I'm envisioning each one, what it would be like to be there, that's um, potentiality. Probability is the one that my father went to where I can get a good scholarship and I'll get, you know, some extra special treatment because I'm the daughter of an alum. That's probability. So those kinds of records exist. And then when I finally make up my mind about which school to go to, then those all those possibilities and probabilities drop away with the energy on the one that I chose. And then if I'm sitting in the one I chose and I think that that was a bad decision, I'm going to go back to the other one. Then that other one kind of reemerges in the reality and the Akashic Records reality and it becomes available. It is a database that is, um, I'll use the word, somewhat sealed in that you and I don't go into the records. We go to the threshold of the records and, and a guide in the records works with us and brings us the information. And the reason for that, or a lot of people have dreams where they're looking at a book in a room by themselves or with a guide that's with them in the room. And and so what I know about the records is that if you or I were in there, and I did this once and got in trouble for doing it, uh -oh. recommend it, um, I found my way into the records. Now, if you can imagine seeing someone that you know and love in this lifetime who murdered you in a past life, you might freak out it, while you're standing in the records. That would create a loop, kind of like, in Back to the Future, when um, uh, the protagonist is holding the family picture while his mother is trying to get him to neck and, and make out. So um, it would create a, a wacky loop, you know, or like in a spreadsheet, a uh, circular argument that won't flow. So that's why we don't go into the records, we go to the threshold and work with guides. And work with guides. And in the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, the major Jewish holidays, uh, uh, you end up uh, being sealed in the Book of Life for a year. And the Book of Life is what you're also referring to. Uh, that has something to do with the Akashic Record. Yeah. In, in some circles, they're, they're the same. In some circles, they're the same. For us uh, in the new technology age there's some resemblance between the akashic record and the cloud mm -hmm. i agree i agree the difference being the probability and the possibility those things are different because the the cloud only does what's happened and for this moment and past but in the akashic record which i didn't know about was like probability and possibility are there and that's a that's an interesting addition uh, to our knowledge about the akashic record <clears throat> i tend to have this idea of uh, something i call the psychosphere that our mental atmosphere that we are all um part of this uh mind uh, that is surrounding the earth uh, just like uh, our atmosphere does and plants and animals as well as our technology and our thinking contribute to this psychosphere and a lot of ideas are floating around in there it's not a, a static thing like a library which is what i imagine the cosmic record may seem like uh it has to be dynamic uh, from what i'm hearing from you and what i think it must be so that there are people here uh thinking about let's say a telephone elisha gray and alexander graham bell and they've got the idea of the telephone from the psychosphere because of all the other experiments and research that have gone on to create that possibility. And then the probability emerged that both of them did it around the same time. Uh, that 
is the that is the image I have of being able to expand our minds to grab out of what looked like to me fish up there swimming around in the psychosphere. I'm a Pisces. I'm very fish oriented. I think these ideas floating around out there. And those of us who are searching for stuff can grab one and bring it down. I agree with you. I have, I have seen what you just described and I have been shown that there are what I would call releases of data or concepts that humans then grasp and turn into something like the telephone. Um, so I, I'm right there with you because I've seen it. What, and it's, you've seen I, it? I mean, what does that yeah. mean, you've seen it? Uh, it's like a grid, like you describe around the earth. And it literally is um, downloading information to those who are ready to receive it. Uh, enough information that they can figure out the rest. And that's where you get simultaneous. Um, independent, independent discoveries. Mm -hmm. Simultaneous independent, independent discoveries. discoveries. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one of my favorite ones of those is uh, Dennis the Menace. Uh, mm -hmm. In March 1951, uh, in England and in the United States, two comic book strips were brought into the public arena named Dennis the Menace. And they both were little kids who caused a lot of trouble, who had dogs that were running around with them, contributing to the difficulty. Interesting. Interesting. I didn't know that one. That's cool. Well, I, I collected a lot of those because they're funny. I mean, and there's a lot of other ones, but that's a funny one. And they tried to see if there was some plagiarism somehow, but no. The two Dennis's were pretty different. One of them was deliberately a bad boy. Uh, in England, and the other one was I like, would stumble into problems, but that was, they were culturally uh, determined uh, and and vibrating with them. So it's a there's difference in their similarities. So let's let's now go from uh, the Akashic record, which I see as like part of the psychosphere, the way I think about it, and it's a dynamic thing. And you, pardon? I agree. And it's and the probability. And the possibility are important. Probability is very, very important in thinking about the future. When we do precognitions, I think there's, a, there's probabilities of things happening, uh, even though they might not. And there's some argument about that. Uh, but that's what weather prediction is based on, is probability. It's, a, it's the same thing. And mm -hmm. I don't know, it's a simpler way to, for me to think about it. And in the Kashuk record, you got probabilities about what might happen. And mm -hmm. That's really cool. So the Akashic Record, I'm glad you're telling me this because it's just making things so much more clear, like having ideas that, anyway. Um, so you woke up to 5D. <laughs> I woke up this morning. <laughs> I, it's great. I woke up this morning to like, <laughs> okay, it's cloudy. Okay, you woke up to 5D. You got, you got to go into that one. <laughs> well, number one, uh, the number one thing that people used to think, I don't think they think it anymore, but I encountered it as, as, a, as a, a way of thinking is that moving into 5D would be some pivotal event or some monumental event and everything would change. And that would be it. Kind of like when you get your driver's license, you can drive anytime you want. However, Moving into 5D is more like a gradual process, like a sine wave. And it's like how we evolve. You know, we do, we make some progress and then we drop back. We make some more progress and we drop back. And that is the uh, way of change. It is the way how humans change. It is how the stock market changes. And, you know, once you start looking at these things and tracking it, you can see it. So the idea of, of waking up in 5D is to be purposeful about it. And one of the ways I do that is I announce to myself when, I, when I'm going to bed, I am waking up in 5D. I will awaken, well rested, no matter what the night holds. That's important if you're a parent or you've got stuff going on, you know, sirens blowing or whatever, because you get disturbed. But no matter what the night holds, I'm going to wake up well rested. Um, so 5D is this amazing place that the closest thing that the average person might be able to 
connect with is it's what everybody else tells us is, is heaven. So it's where you and I have a conversation and it's all, uh, you know, the, the synchronicity, the companion ability, the, the fun, and it never gets to a place where you feel like Maureen, you're doing all the talking or, you know, the, the, the disconnect isn't there. It's just all about connection. And in a way, it's hard for people who are living in a, a very focused 3D life to understand this. But I, I, one of the ways I explain it to people is if someone comes to your door that you love and respect, and maybe you weren't expecting it, maybe somebody you admire, and they show up at your door, are you going to stand there at the door talking to them? Of course not. You're going to invite them in, even if your place is a mess. You're going to still invite them in, offer them a cup of tea or water or something. That is what I call the God choice. The not God choice would be to stand there in the doorway and not let them in. 5D, the not God choice doesn't even occur to you. Just like when you're receiving someone at your door that you treasure, it's not possible to not let them in. Yeah, it's not possible to not let them in. And uh, Marina, I want to know what happens after they let them in, after you let them in. <laughs> Because I think there's a party going on in there is what I'm thinking. Yeah, right. I wasn't invited. <laughs> well, if you come in and I wasn't invited, but I'm here. So and I, I did that the other day. I, I was walking along a river here in Charlottesville and uh, and there was these guys down by the river. It was a lot, it was, there's a walk along the river. It's really nice. Um, and there was one guy talking. Uh, have you been in Charlottesville before? Uh, there's Ravana River, so there's a really nice walk there. And I right, you know, right. swimming, there's a rope thing you can go sw- anyway. The, so I'm walking along and I see this one guy is facing three, four other guys with his back to the river. And I'm standing up a little higher and I say, You know, what you guys are doing reminded me of a Grateful Dead song. And so I start singing, Come here, Uncle John's band by the riverside. And they they didn't let me sing any more than that. They said, come on down. And that was like knocking on the door from what I'm telling you. And I, I walked into this and met a guy that we had so much in common with. And it was just a tremendous experience. It, it, the musical began uh, with that knock on the door, with, with meeting this guy and having so much overlap uh, with, in such a surprisingly fast way. That sounds like what you might be referring to as 5D. Right, exactly so, exactly so. Oh boy, I'm glad to get that straight. Uh, uh, my simple way of saying it, life is a musical and we should all should be singing, uh, but sometimes it's poetry or alliterations or wordplay but it's got to be fun and it's got to be learning is the way I think about it. Very cool. I agree. And and so in 5D, coincidences are your natural way. Are your natural way. Mm-hmm. Excuse me, Ms. St. Germain. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please elaborate on that statement? Um, in 5D... Because you have no resistance to what's in front of you, you easily connect with people, situations, and things that will help you do what you're wanting to do. Spontaneity comes and brings you things that you want to do. Like when you were told to turn left and you got to do a couple of things that you had had on your list, you know, I need to get this done kind of a thing. So you get lined up with everything you need and want. You know, I can remember looking in my closet one day and um, I said to my husband at the time, I, I need some, I maybe even said it to myself, I need some yellow pants because that this, this jacket would look much better with yellow pants. And the next day he says, um, I'm going to a new bank and I want to know if you want to ride along. We're going to, We'll be away an hour. We can have lunch. We'll have lunch up. And I said, sure, why not? And I forgot my little vitamin pack. So I went back to the car to get them and walk back, walk past a shop 
that had the exact yellow pants I needed before I got to the car. So I picked up my stuff at the car and I went in the store. They had my size. I tried them on. I was in and out of the store in 10 minutes and back at lunch before they served the food. That's pretty cool. That's this lineup of whatever you need, the universe is willing to provide. But you have to be able to know it and say it and you have to be willing to hold your joy. When we get stuck worrying or feeling less than, we can't be in our joy. But if we can find our joy, then we can be in 5D. It's that simple. Well, now I understand better what 5D is because I experience it uh, fairly regularly. Uh, right. It's where you have no, <laughs> where you have no um, resistance to what's happening. Mm -hmm. Now, there are times when you might have no resistance to what's happening but you better have some resistance to what's happening because some, sometimes you might start blurring with somebody who feels good to begin with, but is really not so good as time goes on. What about that? Um, I think there could be two things going on. There are a lot of people in the reality right now who are tasked with the job of helping the rest of us uh, heal or learn or grow so their presence is all that's required and they might attract somebody who is a misfit I'll call what you described a misfit the person is projecting one persona but they're really hiding something else a pain person so those persons can the the, the enlightened person is going to attract that but it doesn't mean that that they have a coincidence, what it means is they are the coincidence of that person healing or having the experience that they want to have. Um, what I find that happens, uh, I had an incident in the post office and, and I, I had this fabulous relationship with this post office in New York City. And I would bring them a big box of cookies from Costco, you know, and they, they just put it in the lunchroom, just, you know, one of your fans. I'm so grateful you guys are close by and you're so friendly, blah, blah, blah. So one day I have to deal with a supervisor for something I need. And this is a very unpleasant interaction. And I remember walking out saying, I love the post office. I love the people who work here. What's the deal? And I was told everybody in the post office wants you to clear this woman of her dark energy so that they can all you know get along better so i did and the next thing i know she got moved to another station and what i got from that is the reason she was rattling on my cage was because in the moment i knew what to do i didn't know what to do until i asked but i would be able to act on my inner guidance on what to do and so it's important to recognize that sometimes you're the conduit for some interaction that doesn't pertain to you, other than the fact that you can do it. You know, like, I don't know about you, but I actually pick up garbage on the street and carry it to the bin because I can. I've got a free hand, I'm on my walk. I don't care. I just, you know, touch it with a little bit and, and do that because I, I have such a concern for the welfare of Mother Earth. And I figure I'm not out there saving the ocean. I'm not out there cleaning up, you know, pollution in Peru, but I can pick up this little piece of paper. It's not a big deal. So <coughs> excuse me. You're you're making the uh an analogy between picking up the garbage and clearing out the black energy. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's like it's almost like practice for you to help clear out more complicated dark energy by it's not just you making a small contribution to the planet it's you practicing your art i never thought of it that way but you're right on ah, i hadn't thought of that way either so we did that together because i i don't like to see stuff uh, thrown along the river bank and i pick it up and then one time there was a, a can and something else but there was a bag <laughs> So I put the can and something else in the bag so I could carry it over to the garbage. That was convenient to, to be able to get a little help on that one. 
One time I was on my early walk in New York City and I saw this young man probably in his 20s and he had had, you know, like a Wendy's bag of his breakfast. And I'll bet you the garbage bin was maybe four or five feet away from him. And he just dropped his garbage, started to walk away. And it's crazy that I did this, but I called, hey, (laughs) the guy turned and I pointed to his garbage and then I pointed to the bin and he picked it up and put it where it belonged. It was so funny. And I thought, "Um, Maureen, why did, that's New York City. What are you doing? You know, but I, the neighborhood I was in was a really nice neighbor, neighborhood, very friendly people and sweet people. And I actually asked someone one time, why is it that this neighborhood's got more trash on the ground than all the other neighborhoods in, in Manhattan? And they said, well, the, this group of people, this ethnic group that I was, you know, sharing the, my abode with in that neighborhood, uh, think that there's plenty of policemen here that, and not policemen, but uh, garbage collectors that they can pick it up. And I said, there is not enough staff to pick up after people and unless they um, do it at, in the moment, you know? But it was like a cultural thing. It was very interesting. Yeah, that's, and you wouldn't have known that uh, without asking. Uh, That's right. I wouldn't have. So it's so important to be able to find out what might actually be going on behind that. Um, I, and that's I have to do that uh, sometimes when people approach me, and like uh, they seem to want something from me. Uh, and this must happen to you, and and it's flattering, um, but it's also questionable, um, and I can't figure out what they want because they're leaving it open in kind of a coy way of like trying to be able to maybe have a relationship or something with me. I admire you so much and blah, blah, blah. I've never met them, you know, come up to me uh, uh, at a restaurant and saying, I've always been wanting to meet you. uh, And here you are. Uh, My friend told me what your name was. And I always wanted to be a rock and roll star. There's no question about that one. And that's like being a rock star when that happens. (laughs) I'll sign my book for you, my record thing. But those are, that must happen to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you manage Um, this? I usually say it's an honor to meet you as well. And then they go on, you know, they exude whatever compliment they want. And I just say, thank you. I'm so glad I was able to make an influence. Um, You know, spread the word. Yeah. It's, it's very, uh, it's very gratifying when people do that. And I try to return the compliment that they noticed, you know, you're pretty special too, because you found me, you know. That way, it stays. It stays equal. I don't like it when we do this. I want us to be equal. Yeah. I want us to meet each other where we're at. Yeah, and I'm coming more and more to realize, and I think I may accuse you of this too, Maureen, that <clears throat> I haven't grown up. I'm still about seven or eight years old in there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> you too. Yeah. yeah. That's the way it looks like that look on your face. You're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> it's, ah, there it is. I got you. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like before the romance things happen. Even though it does happen when you're seven. I mean, it does. There, there, there were girls around when I was seven, but it was like you didn't know what to do about it. They just came around. So, so like, um, it's still like just trying to see what's going on. The world is a very curious place. Um, there's a lot of mystery around here and there's a lot of fun to be had and a lot of funny, interesting people to do and a lot of games to play and a lot of things you can figure out and talk to people about. So that's what it's like to be a happy child in a, in in an environment where there's all kinds of things you can do and people you can play with. And that's what it's like when we get to be 5D. All the programming that we've been taught and how to be and how to do doesn't really apply. And um, one of the Ascended Masters that I have channeled put it very succinctly. And they gave this long talk in Hong Kong back in 2018. But the key element of what Sana Kumara said was the game of 3D, the polarity game, is over. The game will end when there are no more players. 
Will you be the first to leave or the last? And my thought immediately was, I'm out. <laughs> well, a different definition. Yeah, it is because we're going to convert everyone to this joyful place by choosing to be so joyful that there's nothing left for them to to do but be joyful back. Oh wow! Wow, I, I like going to dance around here where it's kind of like a um do what you want dance, but there's a social structure in this thing that is implicit, but very much there. Uh, and I won't go through it a lot, but I, I have gone around uh, like playing games with people. Like I make a face and she makes a face, my face, we mirror are each other's faces or like patty cake, patty cake, bakers play those kinds of games. And there was one person who I was kind of dancing with and then she left and I kind of followed her, but she didn't know I was following her. And then she turned around and says, you're following me. And I, and I ran away. It was, it was just like, it was just like playing around in the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. Child's that, play. Child's yeah. play, which is, so important for adults it's not we're all children too uh, and i i saw anyway you were uh, we're going to have to start uh cruising toward the end of this marine but i want to i would like to bring a, a non-joyful idea to you and see what you're doing about it because i'm thinking about this a lot too it appears to me that humanity is uh, on a very slow suicide uh trail right now uh, we're like uh, the frog in the in the hot water that's being slowly boiled and not recognizing clearly enough that we need to jump and we need to jump. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out ways that might be fun to be able to like make a difference. So I suggest that there is a collective human organism of which we're all a part and we can find a purpose in that collective organism because we're each cells in that organism and that we find a purpose of our function, but we also find out how we're connected and function with the whole. Um, I do not agree with your take that we're headed uh, towards this craziness as you have defined. I see it more like tough love and that we are encountering extremes so that we will jump. So it's it's not it's not like we're headed this way, and you know it's a slightly different turn of it. Oh so, yeah. So you know it's like um, I raised four sons, and at about I don't know ten or eleven, I, they started doing their own laundry, and they you started doing what? You started doing what? Their own laundry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they would pile all their clean clothes in a basket and they would put it in their room, not bother folding it. And I didn't say a word, you know, I'm keeping my mouth shut, but I'm, I'm this well-dressed mama who's got these kids walking around in wrinkled clothes. And it's like really painful for me to, to be that person, but I kept my mouth shut. And I kept thinking, what about peer pressure? Isn't somebody going to make a remark to them? Why are you wearing so many wrinkled clothes? I don't know what happened, but one day when I said something about I need to get the ironing board out because I need to iron something of mine, my son pulls out a spray can that's called Wrinkle Free or something like that. And he shows me what he does. That's hilarious. And, and where I'm going with that is those people that are in the pot are going to come up with solutions that are even better than us just jumping maybe they're going to create an invention that lets them fly out. I don't know. But you see, my point is that, that I thought the kids should iron their clothes because that's what I knew to do. And instead, somebody said to them, you know, your clothes are wrinkled. You know, you can get this product, blah, blah, blah. So a friend, a peer pressure, told him how to smooth out his clothes where he wouldn't have to iron them. Uh, I mean, that's uh, 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 uh. So uh, I think... That, that what we're experiencing is is the big wake-up call for everybody. And all we can do is love those who are messing up. You know, as a parent, I remember um, dealing with one of my sons who wouldn't go to school. 
And he would get up. I would drive him to school. And he would, so I'd drop him off. As soon as I was out of sight, he'd walk back home. Two miles. And this would, this went on, you know, and I didn't know what was going on. I'm thinking I'm, I got to cover it. Finally, I got to cover it until, you know, I find out from the school what's going on. <clears throat> so I said to him, you know, there is a law that says you have to go to school. If you don't want to go to school, I'm going to back you. I'm right behind you. But you do need to know that if they catch up with us, they will put you in foster care and they'll probably put me in jail. And if that's the route you want to take, I'm I'm behind you. That's I'm totally cool with that. And then the best part was when his older brother said, you don't have to listen to her. Just learn how to say, would you like fries with that, sir? And you can get a job you and do, you'll be fine. Which, of course, cracked all of us up because the innuendo was, you know, you can always work in a fast food place. Um, but today, I'm happy to report that same son is a commander in the military. Isn't that hilarious? But I empowered him to make his own decisions. And I empowered all my sons to do that. And most parents don't. Most parents are busy telling their kids what they should do. And then the teenage kids are busy trying to show their parents they can think for themselves. And all they have to do is get out of the way and say, you know what, whatever you decide, I'm sure to work out. I'm behind you. Because then, you know what they do? They revert back to what you taught them. But to me, it's like a no-brainer. And the other thing that, I've, that, I, that I got when I was in the records is the parents that are still giving advice to their adult offspring don't know that they did a good job. Because if they knew they did a good job, they wouldn't have to keep doing it. Yeah. So sometimes it's a matter of confidence that the parent doesn't have. And once you realize you did a good job and the best thing is to get out of the way. And I also say to people, you know, when your kids call you and tell you they're gonna do something or not do something, like they're not going to graduate school and you really had hoped they would, you say, I'm sure it's the best decision for you. I know you're making good decisions. Whatever you decide, I'm thrilled for you. And then you get off the phone and scream if you want, but you don't tell them you're screaming, you know, so. Being as uh, I believe that we're, we share one mind, um, sometimes the psychosphere, uh, I bet you nickel, they can hear you screaming too, but they may not know where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I thought I was being this great mom, but you're right. They probably can feel it. My mom's really disappointed, but she's not saying anything. <laughs> well, they, they may not know it's coming from you either i mean it depends on how sensitive they are yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, so it still may be working that there's still something wrong with the decision but uh, <laughs> <laughs> i they, love it they came out right and i love talking with you maureen it's really been a delight uh it's yeah. really been a delight uh, i'm glad to see you uh just talking uh without uh, with just audio the last time and i was in a different state of mind too I, i've developed some since then too uh you're just a lot of fun you know thank you thank you thank you you're welcome I, I i like to um teach that way too i think it's important when you laugh a lot you remember it you remember what you've been taught so. learning entertainment inter interface or info Entertainment or learning and there's a name for it now uh it's like if you're happy it makes everybody else happy we are so connected with each other and as the beginning story suggests we are we mirror each other a lot more than we know and uh i've had a good time with you so thanks for being so happy and and, and giving me a good time with you so thank you it was mutual and i'm so grateful for your audience and the opportunity to be with you and i'll I'll promote your new book when it comes out. Just give me some stuff. Thank you. Yeah, call me. This psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.